Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, tonight's session, we're going to discuss the rabbi's concern with every person's obligation to preserve the dignity of others and protect others from, sh from shame. So we'll meet one couple who implemented this obligation as a dynamic duo and another for whom this avoidance of shame highlighted the adverse interests of the two partners. And then finally, we'll see how the high drama of marital relationships can be transferred to the relationships among the rabbis themselves. Uh, Torah drama and relationships, so it's quite the triumvirate. I am definitely looking forward to learning Torah together with you uh, tonight, Miriam. Uh, without further ado, please take it away. You have to unmute. I should probably <laughs> unmute myself. I support that message. Um, thank you. Hi. So nice to see you back. Thanks, thanks for sticking it out. And um, I look forward to learning tonight. So yeah, I guess you, I, let me open your here. Let me go to your version of the handout and then I will open it for you. So here's our, our handout. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess I sort of telegraphed what's coming. Um, a little bit in keeping with, with last week's exploration of Midrashim about biblical relationships. Um, this is a little bit of a mix of sort of talking about biblical, today's today's plan, talking a little bit about certain biblical relationships. I don't know if they're quite, it's quite a marriage and um, other other relationships and through the lens kind of of shame. So. I won't be too big. Let's just sort of read it. So the first text kind of maybe sets us up, um, which is this Gemara from Kitubo. Um, the Safari translation conveniently tells us that there were previous incidents related to charity. So we have that here. Um, and it's kind of like, a, you know, there's various stories. There's another story later that's a little bit less heroic, also about Marukva. But Marukva seems to have been very involved in charity. Um, so Marukva hava anya b'shivavute. There was a poor person in his neighborhood to have a ragga koyama de shadale arbozuzin. Every day he would send him like four dollars or four dinars. I don't know exactly. Probably it's more than four dollars. It seems like he's, he's Mar Marukva has taken upon himself to support this person in a substantial way. Bitsinura um, didesha. So he would put it sort of like in the, he would like stick it in the hinge near the door. This is what we call like matan beseta, right? So people wouldn't know that, like the people didn't know who it was coming from. Um, great. So, okay. Yomachad, Amar, Ezil, Echziman Ka'avid. Once the guy inside is like, you know, he kind of knows the deal. Like, you know, I'm doing this. You know, the guy doesn't, the person who's giving me money doesn't want me to know who they are. So I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll go, I'll go get the money afterwards. But one day he's like, I want to know who it is. So before Marukba has a chance to go away, um, he says, let me go see. Um, sorry. Right. Right. So that day, Marukva was delayed in the study hall, and his wife came with him to distribute charity. Um, so basically, the, it happens that on the day that the poor person wants to see who's um, been giving him money all this time, Marukva's wife is with him. How exactly it fits with the delay, I'm not so sure. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts. Um, they may, maybe ordinarily, he would have gone home to lunch, but this way she, she met him somewhere, or... Maybe yeah. they were splitting up the work since they had less time to get it done? Maybe, but they're not actually splitting it up because they're together, right? It's sort of like the opposite. Uh, I don't know exactly how that works, but so they were together. So they see like the doorknob turning, like, and it's like, oh no, they're going to discover us, right? Um, right? So the person, um, sorry, I, I made a mistake, right? When they saw that stuff was happening at the door, right? The poor person is resolved that today's the day I'm gonna figure out who it is. So when they saw that, they come to see him. Our Ukfa and his wife sort of like hightail it out of there. They run away um, so that they wouldn't know who he is, right? Rahut um, Mikame, so they ran away from him. I Huatuna, and they entered into a certain furnace to have a Garufa Nura. So it's like already sort of been, we, we met somebody else who hid in a furnace, right? So not hit, but sat in one, right? So this is a little different, but similar, right? There's some idea, but they, they go into sort of a furnace. It's already been raked over. So it's not like on fire, but it's still hot, okay? Um, and it's a good place to hide because nobody's going to think you're in there, right? Hava kam nikalian kar e demar ukva. And his legs were getting, I don't know if I pronounced that right, getting burned. Um, 
are being singed. It's a little bit less of a dramatic word, right? It's uncomfortable. It's very hot. Okay. I'm related to Vitu and his wife said, Shakwal kar eh oti bakari. Put your, your feet on my feet or your legs on my legs, right? Um, because apparently her legs were not getting singed in his words. And his were chalash So he he instead of being like thanks, honey, he feels bad. Why does he feel bad? I mean, they say in, in in English, but what do you think? So right. So basically, his legs are not getting singed. She's like put them on top of mine because she has some sort of supernatural protection from getting burned in this situation. It seems, um, and he gets sad that his wife is more meritorious than he is, right? Or has some like sort of has more protection than he does. Chalash um, date. So he gets sad. And she said, Amrale, Ana Shachichta Begave Debeta, Mimikravna Ahanayate, right? She said, listen, it's not that I'm, we're, we're, we're the same, basically. We do the same thing, which is, in this case, right, and in all cases, right, like the merit that both of us have is supporting poor people. But in this case, um, right, it happens that because I'm usually at home, I give them food, whereas since you're usually going to their houses, you give them money, and then they have to take the money and go to the store, so it doesn't help them as directly. So I have, like, a, you know, more supernatural protection because of my tzedakah than you do because of yours. Um, okay, reactions? I have some reactions, but I'll take yours. So first of all, from the relationship front, right, I feel like this is another situation of a couple where they're like really in tune in most ways, right? It happens that usually, right, in this story, there's some contrivance where they end up in the same place. Usually they're not even in the same place, but they're on the same page, right? They kind of have the same values. They do the same thing each in their own way, right? And when they end up the same, it's like the two of them are, like, it really felt to me like sort of like a comic book. Like they're both running together and then like, like they're sort of, they're like really a duo. This is the dynamic duo from the intro, right? So like, I think there's something interesting about that, right? They're a duo and one of their shared values is to protect the dignity of other people, right? Um, by not only supporting them, but also hiding their identity and making a sacrifice in order to do that. So in some ways, like, I, I don't know if there's that much to, and right, this situation of, right, him being upset because his wife has more is not getting burned, let's say. I think even there, there's a lot of sort of mutuality happening where first of all, the wife offers like, put your legs on my legs because I'm not getting burned. And then, right, that's that's an offer essentially of a sacrifice on her part, right? Because she knows that it's sort of a less sacrifice overall or she's willing, maybe she's willing to take one for the team or she knows it doesn't hurt her as much or whatever it is. But then when she sees that that makes him, her offer to sort of help him physically has made him emotionally sad. She offers him something also to help with that right? She's sort of very supportive, um, very like, you know, any anything that's creating a distance or a dissonance between them, she wants to smooth over, right? Um, and he's a little bit less, more like, a little more self-absorbed because he's a, like, instead of being like, that's great, we're a team, I'll put my legs on yours, he's like, wait a minute, why are your legs not burning, right? But even so, right, she she sort of, in a, maybe a little almost like didactic way, brings it back to like, well, we, we're actually, like, don't worry, we actually are on the same team. Right? We're doing the same thing. It may look like there's a slightly different reaction, but that's sort of like because of this incidental reason. It's not because of any real difference between us. Like we're really sort of a team, a duo. We're, we're like doing this in the same project together, right? Um, so that's a story. As I said, right, when the people get along, sometimes there's less to say. Um, so here we are, right? So you have this, this couple, right? They are, they're protecting a third party from shame right? And they're sort of like, you know, values driven really on the same page and like acting in concert. Lovely, right? Um, here we're going to meet our biblical character. Umay Kule Hai, right? What's like, why would they, meaning like, this is a nice story, but like, should you really jump into the oven rather than have somebody discover that you've been giving them money? Like, you've been giving them money. That's a nice thing. Okay. So like, it's not as nice as it was before they knew who you were, but what's the big deal? Okay. Marzutra. So it comes from this statement of Marzutra. And this statement appears um, several places in Tanakh. We're gonna, sorry, not in Tanakh, in Talmud. We're going to see one more. Dama Marzutra bar Trivia Amar Rav. Ve'amrila Amar Rav Huna bar Bizna Amar Rav Yishim Chasida. Ve'amrila Amar Rav Yochanan Mishim Rav Yishim Ben Yochai. Right? So there's there's three different sort of traditions as to who said it in whose name. Okay. Noach lo la Adam. It is better 
even you could translate it as more pleasant for a person to throw himself into a fiery furnace, rather than whiten his fellow's face. What does it mean to whiten someone's face? Embarrass them. Yeah, to embarrass them. Usually what color do we think? People, can I, um, I'll ask for a second. We do like a mild show of hands for people who are familiar with this, um, this general, this statement or not, right? Yeah, okay, all right, so you guys have to tell me things. All um, right, so why Why is your, usually we think your face turns red when you get embarrassed. Why does your face turn right when, white when you get embarrassed? The blood drains from your face. Yeah, yeah right, so there's more so the blood drains from your face, right? It's it's almost like, it's a little different than like, oh, I'm embarrassed, he, he, he. It's like you're like, like, like sort of blanched, right? I mean, that's why it's analogized to murder because it's like you're causing somebody's blood to leave their face. Okay, um, right, so how do we know that you should sort of turn willing, right? you should willingly turn yourself over to a fire or in this case, right? It, it seems to me, right? Like this story was constructed with this statement in mind, like whether the story happened or not, right? It's sort of like, it's, it's too convenient. Like, and then they went, the most, the best place for them to hide was an oven. And we learn from Tamar that you have to sit in an oven, right? So like, it seems like the story is constructed because the statement of Tamar is sort of very out there, um, right? It's better, we haven't mentioned Tamar actually, right? It's better to sort of allow yourself to be put into a furnace rather than embarrass somebody, right? Manalan, and how do we know that from Tamar, as it says, as she was taken out? So does somebody want to review for us the proof from Tamar? For those who are not. Right, so we know the story. This is Tamar Yudan Tamar. Um, I was just looking, as I was looking up Gemara's about her today, I realized that like um, a lot of times, right, in the Gemara, it says Tamar Kalate to whatever, Tamar Bat David, because you have two biblical Tamar. So it, like, you're always like, why is it always calling her that? It's calling her that to distinguish her from the other Tamar. That's at least I, that may be obvious to everyone else. But it was interesting. I noticed that today. So, um, uh, right, so we learn from Tamar. What's the basic story of Tamar Yudan? Oh, I was going to say Tamar, Tamar yeah. saw that Yehuda wasn't giving her as a wife to his youngest son, so she sat at the crossroads and pretended she was a prostitute, and then he had relations with her, and she took um, his uh, stick and some other signs, and then um, he found out she was pregnant, and he got very upset, and um, <clears throat> rather than embarrass him and say that... Um, you know, he said she should be burned because of that. And rather than embarrass him and say that, well, you were the one who did it, she said, you know, it was the man who these things belonged to. Right. So he would say it is the beginning of that verse where as she's being taken out to be executed, she, he shall chal chamiya, right? She sent to her father-in-law rather than being like, this is Judah's. She sent it to him and gave him the option to pretend that he never saw it. Right. Um, there's actually a Gemara that I didn't bring, which says that then like Satan came and tried to like hide the thing so that Judah would forget about it. Um, trying to sort of like, you know, basically get Tamar killed before it was, you know, to prevent the birth of King David. But um, so that's kind of interesting, right? But like, in some ways it's highlighting the fact that in the text, there's a moment where Tamar could have, where Judah could just been like, well, what's Steph? I don't know. And that would be the end, right? So Tamar was sort of, took a risk that Judah would shirk responsibility and the risk is that she's going to get burned, right? In order to prevent herself from shaming him. Like, Tamar's actions seem a little extreme, more extreme than our rabbi friend, than Mr. and Mrs. Marukva, um, because A, it's a real burning fire that's going to kill you, not just like sort of burn your legs. And B, right, Yehuda is actually at fault here, right? Like, she's trying to prevent Yehuda from his own shame, right? Where Yehuda has sort of like, you know, like Yehuda has set up the situation where he could possibly be shamed by his own choices as opposed to these poor people. Okay. Maybe Tamar realized that Yehuda usually stepped up to the plate. Um, right. She so, had a lifetime of him not stepping up to the plate though. Right, but, so it's sort of like- He didn't. <laughs> There is a reading of this story that it's like all this like, you know, diabolical plan of Tamar to encourage him to take responsibility. Um, a few years ago, I discovered an alternative reading of the story, which I like a lot, which is that she, she never intended to. So, right, the alternative is, that, I forget who says this. I actually wrote a short piece about this for 929 a while ago, um, that Tamar actually just wanted to, she just wanted to talk to him. 
she just like went out there to sort of like catch him and be like, you know, it's like when you try and ambush the senator in the hallway or whatever, like he won't give me the time of day, but if I go where he is, like he'll have to talk to me. But Yehuda sort of like, before he even saw her, processed her as a prostitute because she's a woman out there in the field and like didn't recognize her and she couldn't get through to him that way. So she sort of had to like uh, deal with whatever plan B Right, that like her plan was not originally to get pregnant from Yuda on that encounter. But anyways, I thought that was that's sort of interesting. Um, you can read about that if you want. Otherwise, but right in in I think like in some ways in this Gemara's plan, right? Like Tamar has a whole plan that involves getting pregnant and carrying the child, and she's willing to risk that all in order to not shame the father whose fault the whole situation is. Right. So that's kind of interesting. Um, here's another incident involving Mar Okva and a pauper. Um, which I think maybe, I think it connects to the first one, even though it doesn't really. Right, the first one is about his willingness to suffer physical pain in order to save someone else from shame, him and his wife. So here, um, and then we'll contrast it to Tamar, I promise. Right, so Mar Ukfa, right, so again, we see some certain like, this is linguistically similar to the pre previous story in a way that makes you wonder like how, actually distinct they are from a textual historical perspective, but okay. Can you scroll right. up, please, Miriam? Yeah, Thank sorry. You. Right, so Marukva, the first, the one above is Marukva had uh, somebody in his neighborhood and he gave him four zuzim every day, right, or four dinar every day, I think, right here he had somebody in his neighborhood, he would give him $400 every Arab Yom Kippur, right, Yom Kippur, every Yom Kippur, as we saw in the Palimo story, for those who are here, is like a normal, it's a, a famous time for charity giving, it seems, right? So, Yomachad, right, one day, Shadrinu Nihale Biadbre. One day he sent his son with the money. And this is, there are other stories like this. I think there's a different story where a different rabbi sends his wife with the money. And they come back and they say, Ata, Amrle Lod Sarich. They don't deliver the money because they say, This guy is not as poor as you think he is. Right? He doesn't need the money. Amrle Mai Chazit. So he says, Oh, what did, yeah, what did you see? Chazai. I saw that they were pouring him old wine, meaning this guy is not like if you don't give him money, he's going to be eating scraps of bread from the garbage or whatever, or now have no food. Like he not only has food, he has fancy food, right? Um, he said, oh, well, if he's so, um, if he has such expensive tastes, basically, um, then he needs even more money and he sent him back double. Okay, so what's the common thread of Marukva, let's say? Well, there's there's a halacha, at least the way we understand it now, that if somebody was accustomed to a rich lifestyle and suddenly is no longer able to maintain that lifestyle, that it is the responsibility of the Balai Tzedakah to maintain that person in the rich lifestyle. Right. So this, there is a halacha based on the Hasuk de Machsoro that whatever, right, you have to sort of support somebody in the lifestyle to which they are, were previously accustomed. Okay, right. so that's true. Marukva is following that. Um, so he's careful about Is this story about just making that honor. halachic point, though? What'd you say? He's, that, so I was leading to with that, that he's careful about other people's honor. He's careful about other people's what? Sorry. Honor. Right. He's very, he's sort of, in the first situation, he's very careful and willing to make a physical self-sacrifice. In the second situation, it's not that he's making, it doesn't, it seems like he has a lot of money, right? It's not that the money is the biggest sacrifice, um, but that he, um, he's willing to assume the best about others in some way, right? Like this is the most charitable, no pun intended, really no pun intended, but right, like interpretation of the situation is like, yeah, he's still poor, but like obviously he also has expensive taste, so I'll help him even more. But he's sort of willing, he's willing to be generous, sort of read someone else's situation generously. Um, and I think that, that those sort of go together, right? The willingness to some amount of self-sacrifice or self-negation goes together with the willingness to ascribe more to someone else. Sort of similar to what we saw with Rachel, maybe, right? Where like, like this idea of sneed and sort of self withhold. Um, maybe for those who are here. But um, how does this all compare to, to Tamar, right? Like, is Mar are Marukva Mar and Tamar the, the same, right? Marukva is just doing what Tamar did. She's just doing what he did. Not really, right? Tamar is much more 
is much less a person who's like, like Marukva by the second story, he feels almost like he's like hopelessly naive, right? Like in order to be the kind of person who would make the sacrifice in the first story, maybe you have to be the kind of person who would make these like extremely generous assumptions about another person, right? Um, so like, he's just sort of very naive and he and his wife are like competing for who's more holy and who gives more charity, right? But then they're not competing because they get along and softly, right? Whereas Tamar is very much like, um, you know, she's very not naive about Yehuda's character and about the kind of ways that you might need to prepare to confront him or not confront him or sort of to trick him or to sort of lead him to be his best self is not just like, oh, well, I'm sure she doesn't say, like he says, oh, well, if he's drinking old wine, he needs more money. She doesn't say, well, if Yehuda hasn't married me to Sheila, then he must have a reason, right? She knows that he doesn't have a reason. Um, so I think that that's kind of like a, a difference. And in the case of Yudan Tamar, they're going to end up um, being like um, they're and they end up as something of a couple, or at least as like co-parents. Um, and right, like the, the the relationship began in this situation where the question of shame and dignity was kind of like a a distance between them. Let's say so. Maybe we'll talk about that coming up in the next tomorrow. But yeah, so right, they're sort of both extreme. Um, thanks, Viva. Right, so you think there's like a, you're saying the two stories of Marukva are both Tamar and Marukva. Is it okay to read her comment for those who are following? Oh yeah, so Viva wrote in the chat, there's a certain impetuosity and extremity of response in both over the top gestures of Tamar and Marukva, right? That both of them are kind of, um, yeah, Marukva seems like sort of like a caricature in some ways. Um, Tamar, yes, right? Well, which gesture do you think is over the top? You can talk if that works for you, but. Um, right, so like, I think Tamar, certainly her situation is extreme and the risk she's putting herself at is extreme, right? The, right, the whole sort of, the whole thing of like the basically, you know, like the trick on Yehuda or whatever it is, or the, the plot, however you want to read it. Yeah, I think so. But I think it's over the top in a much less naive way, right? To me, that's sort of the big difference is that like, she is very aware of the foibles of the people she's in contrast with. Um, but yeah, I think, right, in some ways, right, any stories that are going to be proof texts or support. Right, so we have sort of like, it's almost like the two sides of the coin where, what, and I think it's not an accident, right, like that the hopelessly naive person who just like, you know, is so forgiving of others is also the one who has this like, you know, seamless relationship with his wife in some way. Right, whereas Tamar, right, the person who she's sort of machinating against is her potential partner in some ways, right? Like the, that, like she's she's willing to sacrifice herself for his dignity, but it's not like Marupa's wife who's willing to sacrifice her legs for her husband's wife. It's like because they're actually not on the same team, right? She's sort of taking a big risk and leaving a gap between them in terms of their goals. Okay. Hold on. So there's two in the Marupa story. There are two people whose dignity is being protected. There's the Ani, the poor person, but then in her, in her sort of managing Ukva's feelings, she's sort of protecting his dignity as well. But the main part of the story is the poor person's dignity, not the partner's dignity. Correct. Right, and I think that that's true, right? It's, like, it's set up as like the two of them protecting him. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think, but it's also because he's the kind of person who could never make a plot against his partner, right? And in some ways, right, his, his over the top reaction to the possibility that she's more righteous than him is kind of the same, where he's just like, he's sort of like, his, his naivete is almost like a little bit self absorbed, but still, like, I don't know, I find it a little charming. I'll take it. Um, okay. So I'm trying to decide whether we should, um, yeah, I'll read this because I think it, it will, it will wind up the Tamar side and then we'll move on to them. Um, so here is a right? Yehuda, Shekidei Shem Befarhesi, right? So even though Tamar gave him the option of opting out, right? There's a, there's a longer Agadah about Yehuda on the 10th page of Sota, but um, even though Tamar had given him the option of opting out, right? And also quotes our statement about the fiery furnace, right? He still um, sanctified the name of heaven in public, right? Zechav Benikra Kulo Al Shmo. Right, he has all the letters of God's name 
included in his name. It's basically like Yud Kei Vav with a dollar. Okay. Ashmosh um, Kadosh Baruch Hu. Kevan Shahoda the Amar said Kamimani. Right when he said when he admitted right Yehuda the name is to admit and there's sort of you know a lot of soon in the parsha we can talk about it right there's a lot of Torah about chapter 38 of Genesis and how right the whole this is like the turning point in Yehuda's life where he goes from kind of trying to weasel around things to you know taking responsibility for his actions um, when he said she's more righteous than I am or she's righteous it's from me as it's often understood by the rabbis right yes a bottle came out and said Tamar right you have saved Tamar and her two sons from the fire. Right. So I will save three of your children from the fire, meaning Hanan and Mishael right, who are going to be later thrown into a fire and miraculously saved. Right. So sort of like Yehuda, right? Like Tamar makes a sacrifice in some ways to allow Yehuda to have the moment where he can then save her back. Right. Like she sort of saves his shame so that he can save her life, and then she sort of that she allows, she gives him that space to then become like this amazing leader, according to the book, right? Um, who like, you know, is the progenitor of other leaders. Um, Tadkami many, right? When she, when he says Tadkami many, how did he know? So Abako also told him that and said, Mimeni as his machine, right? Tadka, it's like Mimeni is not Yehuda necessarily, Mimeni is for me, but it's like Abako saying like, oh, I told you. Um, so we can move that aside, but it's kind of funny. Right, so this is what I this is what I really want to get from this book. This book paragraph. Right, in Breshit it says that the children are born, and then he the simple translation is Lo Yasaf Olda He did not continue to know her biblically, right? To like sleep. Um, okay. Amar Shmuel Saba Chamua Derev Shmuel. Hello, are you guys still there? Yes, we're still here. We can hear you. You're still on the phone, so I lost the video, but I'll just keep talking, right? So sh I guess it's good that I did that. Shmuel Saba, the father-in-law of Shmuel, Rav Shmuel Bar Ami, said in the name of Rav Shmuel Bar Ami, right? Kevan shiyeda'a shuv lo pasak mimena, right? Lo yasak doesn't mean he never, he didn't continue. It means he never stopped being in a relationship with her, let's say, um, right? And then he has another proof where that verb, that verb yasak can mean he never stopped, right? So the same look it comes up, Regarding the shofar that's one of Matan Torah, Kol Gadol Lo Yasaf. Does that mean it never stopped or it didn't continue? Right. So okay. So that's Machloket. So there is an opinion, right, that this moment between Yehuda and Tamar is the beginning of a relationship, right? So it could belong in the husbands and wives category, as opposed to this sort of like one-time thing where she got what she wanted and then went home, right? Um, so if we take that back upstairs, I think in some ways it really highlights the contrast to Ramar Ukba. Of uh, Yuda and Tamar, have, they end up being a pair of partners, right? But they're sort of a pair who are, they're like evenly matched, more of like an inter connecto kind of situation than like a dynamic duo where there's like not as much of a uh, distance between, right? There's always, there's always the potential, if your relationship starts out this way, there's always the potential for a distance between you, for a very serious distance or lack of trust that sort of this is imagining them overcoming in some way, which I think is very interesting. And it's, in some ways, they're able to build on that because the relationship starts with each, with each of them sort of giving the other, in the end, more than they would have initially thought they deserved, right? Sort of, Tamar gives Yehuda the option to opt out of saving her by, it's like saving himself from shame, meaning in the same time, she's basically willing to sacrifice herself to save him from shame thereby giving him space to do the right thing in a magnanimous way as opposed to sort of a conflict-based way. Okay, so let's bring that to our next. So this is, this Gemara is very famous. I like to teach it. Some of you may have learned it from me before. It's okay, we'll learn it again. You can learn it many times. You might think, I know this Gemara already in this morning, but I hope that it will not be, okay? This is Gemara from Bava Messia. Mentet, I'm an Aleph, I'm a Bet. If you know what it is. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we've discussed it more or less. Okay. Um, right, so this is a long um, passage, we can call it, like a long sugya on a Mishnah that I didn't bring here on the subject of Ona Antmarim, which is verbal oppression. Then there's a, this, what is it? I think it's the third or fourth parak above the Sia, is about mostly Ona Mamon, which is basically when a price is too high 
such that the transaction is automatically canceled or too low, meaning when the price is off from whatever the, the real value of the goods are. And then it says actually, right, it's called, it's considered like oppressing someone if you tell them to pay too much. And then it says also there's actually on oh, the story, right? That you can also sort of cause someone pain or sort of oppress them with words, similar maybe. And it starts with, with um, examples that are related to like, um, to financial transactions, but it extends beyond there, right? If you talk about, say bad things about non jews in front of the children of converts, or you say sort of, you, you use language that calls to mind people, sort of like triggers people's bad memories, basically. Um, then that could be like, um, or shameful memories. Then that is called an odd story. So there's a long studio about all sort of a bunch, it's basically a collection of a bunch of short sayings about Ona Karim and how important it is to speak kindly to other people and to protect their feelings. Um, so I remember, so I, I have brought excerpts here. Um, the excerpts that I have brought are emphasize the direction that I want to take with this idea, but you can go back and look at the whole thing if you want. Okay, so I remember, Sister Bratshuvi, Amarav. So again, we have a bunch of different people. It's not clear exactly who is the origin originator of this tradition, right? And we have the the claim about Tamar, right? That Tamar, right, not shaming people, right, not performing verbal oppression is so important that Tamar is willing to die rather than commit it. Okay, so we know that. So we're starting. This is sort of the first. Um, the other examples are like you're sitting around with the guys. You shouldn't say like you know, talk about stuff hanging when somebody's parent was hanged by the Romans or by the Jewish authorities, right? You shouldn't talk about people's, you know, past or their parents' past or whatever it is, right? It, it's sort of, it's not in a marital context. So this is the first time in the city that some sort of, a, oh, well, almost the first time, except something else is tangentially related, right? There's some, there's some sort of man-woman component to the avoidance of shame, let's say. So I'm a rough. And then there's a little, a few things that happen, right? Here's what I said. The person should always be extremely careful to avoid um, mistreating or oppressing his wife with words. Which is, is interesting, right? Because she cries easily. Now, you, we can talk about whether, right? I see I see a, a raised eyebrow. That's fine, right? Um, right? Because she cries easily. It's easy to oppress her. Well, now, Takrova in this case seems to mean, right, like you cross the line quickly, right? It's easy to cross the line such that God will punish you, right? Like basically, if your wife has thicker skin, then maybe you could say meaner things to her, but she's not going to have thick skin because she's a woman, so you better be careful. Um, so what have we learned about men and women, right? Men sort of protect the feelings of women by not speaking too harshly to them because women are very fragile and they cry. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating these stereotypes because we're going to see that the Gemara itself will undermine them. Right. Okay. Um, so, so Amar Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer said, "Miyom shacharav beit hamikdash, mina alu shari tefila." Right. The gates of gates, the gates of prayer are locked. We have a pasuk to try and prove that. Right. Shaarei dmaot loni nalez, but the gates of tears are not locked. So basically, right. God doesn't necessarily react to your explicit request, but God will react to your just like heartfelt, nonverbal suffering expressed through, through crying, right? Um, and then we have our proof text for that. And now, so remember, it was Rav who said you should always be careful not to oppress your wife. Rav also said, and Rav is our, I believe, is our guy who had a not great relationship with his wife, as we saw in some previous class, right? So, Fala Rav, Koha Lefa, Sadi Stone, or Felbi Hingon. But if you actually listen to your wife's advice, then you go to hell. Shinema right? right? Because all women are like Jezebel who brought her husband down. Ahab was otherwise a very nice guy. Um, with only his mean wife who makes him away. Okay. So um, so Rabha seems to say two things, right? First he said, well, do those things go together, right? He said, you should always be careful not to oppress your wife, but you should also not listen to your wife. What's the common thread or are they in contrast? Maybe that women are irrational. <laughs> they're delicate right, they're, creatures they're, they're without much brain. What did you say? Delicate creatures without much brain. Right. So they are, um, we're going to talk about what about this thing about, the Gemara is going to push back on this not following advice thing in a minute. So hold that thought, Riva. But yeah. So right, like, there seems to, both of these statements are actually very paternalistic, right? The man's job is to manage his life. He manages his feelings, he manages his ideas. Okay? 
So like, again, right, I'm highlighting that stereotype because as we're gonna see in the story that follows, it ain't always so, okay? Um, so great. So now, I'm going to Rav Papa to Abaye after Rav said, don't listen to your wife's advice. Rav Papa said to Abaye, the ha'am re'inshi, but we have this popular saying, which is an interesting source. Um, <laughs> nobody ever accused Jezebel of not being smart. Right. Um, she's just bad. So maybe you have to manage their morals or their ideas. Okay. We'll take that. Um, their feelings and their morals. Okay. I think the Matamasya literally means, right, her, her tears are sort of present, right? It's not that hard to get them out. Like she cries easily. I don't know. Um, okay. So Papa said to Abaye, right? But don't people say we have a popular saying which is going to now compete with Rob, right? If your wife is short, you should bend down to, to whisper to her. Um, in the Sincino translation, they translate you should bend down and hear her whisper, which is, I don't think what it says, but right, it's understood by the Gemara to mean you should take counsel with your wife. Right, even though this the statement is you should talk to your wife, it's understood by the Gemara to mean right, you should discuss with your wife, not just like I mean she could have input into the outcome, right? So how can it be? Rob said you should never listen to your wife or she'll bring you to hell. And now we have a popular thing which apparently we're validating that actually you should take your wife's advice. Okay? Low kasha, not a problem, right? Ha Bamila de Alma, ha Bamila de Beta, right? It's not a problem. Okay, right. One is regarding matters of the world, and one is regarding matters of the home. I.e., regarding matters of the home, you should consult with your wife. But regarding matters of the world, you should not listen to your wife because she's going to lead you down the wrong path. Or some people say, "Lish uh, nafri." Other people say, "Have a de shmaya, have a de am." Actually, even matters of the world, you should also consult with your wife. But in matters of heaven, meaning religious matters, you should not listen to your wife. Right? Then the man should be the man of heaven. Okay. And it's, the way we say religious matters is matters of heaven. So at the very, right, there's a machloket, right? Definitely matters of the home are the domain of the, of the women or share. Matters of heaven are the domain of men. And matters of the world, there's a machloket between the two forms, the two harmonizations as to who they belong to. Okay? So, so far, what do we know? Um, we know that women cry easily. Men are supposed to manage them in some way. They're not supposed to be mean about it, but maybe they're supposed to sort of control, at the very least, the religious orientation of the house, the relationship to heaven, and maybe even sort of the relationship to the wider world. Okay? That's what we know. Hold those up. Okay. Bauer Michal, well, this is going to round out our list of statements about, right, it's not directly about verb hurting somebody with words. You should always be, a man should always be, I just did the thing that I always yell at people about doing, right? When you learn, when you use Gemara language, you start to use the second person as the default male, right? You should always be but it's not right here. It's a man should always be um, should always be careful about the honor or dignity of his wife. Because she's sort of a source of all the blessing in the house, and all these great things happen. As it says, right, speaking of the Avram example, Avram Right. Interestingly, who 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 gave Avram good stuff because of her, Sarah? Avi Melef. I think it's Paro. 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 It was not Avram's finest moment where he. Like um, allowed his sister sister wife to be abducted by Paro and then got a lot got rich by it. So it's sort of an interesting proof text. But okay. Um, but the point is right. Like you should um, be careful. It may be actually part of the proof is right. Like God there was more um, zealous about Sarah's honor than Avram actually. But that like that ended up Avram ended up sort of becoming wealthy from the whole situation. I don't know. It's not, this isn't exactly what this specific is quoted, but if you want to read it more nicely, you can, right? Um, so basically, right, this pasuk, sorry, this this whole sugya has gone from sort of like protecting people's dignity in the baby drash in the marketplace to the real location of sometimes some of the more sensitive um, emotional situations, which is the interpersonal family situation, right? Those are the people you can really hurt. The most easily. Maybe that's part of what the Matamatsuya means, right? The way it's phrased, I think it puts it on the women. Women are like this. But what it actually means is in your intimate relationship, that's the place where it's easiest to really hurt somebody um, in some way. First of all, because like you get the most annoyed with those people often. I don't, maybe I don't want to subject or anything. But um, right, like that's where that's where attention comes down. I mean, many of us spent a lot of time with people we do very much love over the last several months. And like sometimes we might have not always gotten along even if we chose to live with those people, let's say. Um, 
or even if you didn't choose them, they Hashem chose them, you for them, like your children, right? But like, right, we all sort of are familiar with the idea that in your intimate or family relationships is where sort of the potential for both like irritation and harm may be elevated, let's say. Um, right? The Haina de Amar Lei Rava Lebedei Lechuz, and Rava used to tell the people of Mahoz, Mahoza, right? You should honor your wife because you'll become rich, which is like, this is what rabbis say when they want you to do something, they tell you that it's going to make you rich so that you'll do it, right? Um, like when they want you to give master, they tell you it's going to make you rich also, right? Because, you know, you might not want to give master, but they tell you that it will make you rich. So then you will. Um, okay. So basically, like, we have a sugi that has a pretty, um, I would say, like, a little bit of a stereotypical approach to relationships between husbands and wives. It's very concerned with preserving the dignity of your wife, but it's very hierarchical and makes certain stereotypical assumptions about what in the process of sort of taking care of women in a paternalistic way. Okay, so now we have a story. This story is very famous. Um, I'm not interested in the part that most people are, that usually people are interested in for now. Okay, so Tanan Hatam, we taught there in a Brita, or in a Mishnah, sorry, Chitchol Chuliot. If you cut up an oven into segments, then a ton hold in chulia and chulia, and you put sand between the segments so that it's modular, basically. It's not, it's not, not connected with mortar like bricks. It's sort of like you can take it apart and put it together easily, right? Um, so there is a question as to the purity status of such an object. Is it susceptible to tuma or not, right? If it's things that are susceptible to tuma have to be Kalim vessels with a big kibul with sort of like a receptacle. Is this really a kli or is it just a bunch of broken pieces of oven that happen to be piled together in the shape of an oven but are not actually an oven? So Rabbi Leizer makes a hair, which doesn't mean he says it's pure, it means he says it's not susceptible to impurity. Which means it's susceptible to impurity. Okay? Does anyone know where this is going? Is this pe I mean, why people uh, bury their spoons? Is this why people what? Is this why people bury spoons in dirt? I don't think so. For Tulan Tara purposes, I don't think so. I think they did that Gosh, for right. purposes. Um, okay. So, Vizehu Tanu Roshalachnai. This type of oven that is cut up into pieces and put back together is the oven of Achnai. Now, maybe many of us know the story, right? That's the oven of Achnai. Why is it called Achnai? Rabbi Huda says because they surrounded it or probably him with words, right? So in its original context, even though many of us probably know, many people even probably know what I'm about to say, right? But in an original context, the story of the oven of Achnai, which is often presented as we're about to see as a sort of like triumphant situation of who's, um, you know, who gets to interpret halacha and all these kind of questions is a story about how do your words make somebody feel, right? And the rabbis surround Rabbi Eliezer with words and, um, the, the of an impure. So I'm gonna I'm gonna speed through the actual story in order to get to the part that I'm interested in. Okay. I might even summarize. Right. Basically, the sages and Rebbe have a big disagreement. Okay. Um, as to the status of this oven, Rebbe Leizer keeps on bringing proof and trying to explain away all their objections to show them the oven is not the oven is not susceptible to impurity and the they just reject all of his explanations, but low key blue him anyway, right? They don't accept any of his arguments. It doesn't say why not, right? Amar um, and then he starts to bring these miraculous proofs. Right? Maybe let this tree prove it, and the tree jumps, and the Rabbi, Rabbi Yehoshua says, we don't accept proof from a tree. Right? Then he says, well, maybe if the halacha follows me, then the water will prove it, and the water goes in the wrong direction, and Rabbi Yehoshua says, we can't bring um, proof from water. And then he says, well, let the walls of the baby drosh prove it, right? And the walls start to fall, and Rabbi Yeshua yells at them, and he says, right, we're just having a halachic argument. What is your concern there? Um, and then the, the walls kind of like uh, stay slanted. Um, this part of the story is obviously very, very rich, but it's not about husbands, wives, and human dignity yet. So I'm going I'm to rush through it, okay? Um, right, and finally, right, Rabbi Eliezer has like a trick up his sleeve, right? Chazar Ramalahem in halacha kimoti, if the halacha follows me, min hashamayim, this is important for us, let them prove it from heaven, which we've met heaven before in this sugya, okay? Yetzha um, bakol, so a bakol came out, bakol, by the way, means literally echo, right? It's used in a bunch of these gemaras to mean 
that it's um, you know, a heavenly voice, but it means an echo. So it's kind of like a little bit of a distant communication. I just always like to point that out. Um, so Batko comes down and says, right? Why are you bothering Rabbi Eliezer? Right? Like, what's your problem? Why do, you, why do you feel the need to argue with him? He's always right, essentially. At which point, Rabbi Yeshua says, actually, he's never right, because we don't have to listen to you, Mr. Batko, or Ms. Batko, right? Because the Torah says, Loba shamayimhi, right? It's not in heaven. The, the decision-making process of halacha is between us, the rabbis, and Rabbi Eliezer, right? Rabbi Eliezer is in the minority, so we don't have to listen to him. Um, in fact, we're not supposed to listen to him. We're supposed to follow the majority. And we don't care what you say, Bach. Well, because Loba Shemayimhi, right? It's not in heaven. It's not up to heaven to decide. This is where many people end the story, right? Then many people end, include this one more thing. Ashkai Rabbi Natan Eliyahu. If Rabbi Natan found Eliyahu, Eliyahu always seems to be around when you need him, right? Amrale, my Kani Kuchabrihu Vayishanka. What was God doing at that time? Um, okay, what was God doing at that time? He said, Kachayech, he was smiling. There's, there's slightly different, um, there's other, there's a Yerfa issue. Some people have gachich, I think, which maybe changes the meaning slightly, but okay. Chayif Amar, he was smiling, he said, Nizchuni Banai, Nizchuni Banai. My children have defeated me, which I always like to say, right? This is like when I'm trying to play chess with my nine-year-old son, where it's like actually embarrassing for me how much better that he is than me, but also it makes me feel good. This is my kid, right? Um, so it's kind of like that, right? Like when your children have outsmarted you, you feel like, um, as a parent, you feel good, even if you don't feel bad, right? So God has been sort of like outsmarted by Rabbi Yoshua, put him in his place, and you stay up, you stay out of it, God, right? That's heaven, that's not, that's not for this. Um, okay, in terms of the symbolic relevance of the oven, meaning we saw the oven as sort of replaced as maybe like, like symbolizing kind of like sexual arousal. Is that what you're suggesting? Oh, not, oh, 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 nah, not, oh, nah. um, oh, nah. I think there may be symbolic value to the oven. It's in a, okay, in terms of the symbolic value of this purity based must look at, I'm going to recommend an article by Dr. DeVore Steinman, which is wonderful about the death of Rabbi Eliezer. Um, if you contact me or you contact me, Sidrisha, I'm happy to find a citation for it. Um, I think it's in like a fetch strip. I also have a copy. Um, where she talks about the symbolism of the, the types of, um, the types of things that Rabbi Eliezer and Chachamim are arguing about in the context of the oven are things that are receptacles that are filled in. Um, they're sort of like quasi receptacles, and the question is, like, basically, are things can can think, are things modular, or do you have to accept them as um, which maybe has some, has sort of symbolic impl implications for their general machlokah. So, yes, but no is the answer. I'm not sure if the oven per se has to do with ona, or it's just sort of the jumping off point for this. Okay, so that's sort of like like I said, right? This this very rich story about like the nature of halacha like actually appears in this Gemara because the point is the rabbis were mean to Rabbi Elias, right? They made him feel bad, right? They encircled him like a snake. And now, right, he feels really bad. So now let's look at section four. Amru, so they said, right? Not only did they outvote him, they basically excised him from their community and they buried everything that he had previously declared, declared pure because his opinion that something is pure is now no longer relevant. Okay, and then they excommunicated him. Brown Rue, and then they said, who's going to go tell him? Right? Rabbi Akiva, Ani, Rabbi Akiva says, I'll go, because if the wrong person goes and tells him, it could destroy the whole world. So we're, going to, we're going to see what that means. Okay, so what did Rabbi Akiva do? He put on black clothes, he wrapped himself up in sort of a black cloak, let's say, and he sat before him for a mode away, which is the rule for somebody who's been excommunicated that you can't come too close to them, right? And Rabbi Eliezer said, Akiva, my yummy and mine, what's going on? Why stay different? So Rabbi Akiva says, it seems to me that your fellow, your colleagues are separating themselves from you. And Rabbi Eliezer understands what he's saying. He's saying that he's been excommunicated, right? So Asu Karabi Adab, so he, he, unclear which were probably Rabbi Eliezer, he tears his clothes um, and he takes off his shoes and he sat on the ground and his eyes um, are sort of not dripping, streaming, flowing, flowing is the word I'm looking for. They're flowing with tears, um, right? And at that time, as his eye, like the water coming out of his eyes is sort of like, this is also like one of these like cartoon moments where you can imagine it sort of like, um, like these teardrops are sort of like 
transforming into pestilence, basically. And the crops of like a third of the crops of the world are destroyed, right? Um, okay. Right, not only his, are his eyes dripping water, but actually they're shooting fire, right? Everywhere he looks, burns. And this is what Rabbi Akiva was concerned about, right? That, that he's going to destroy the world, so we have to manage his emotions a little bit. As I said, right, we have to manage his emotions, right? So who is Rabbi Eliezer? Right, in some ways, he's the wife of the Chachami. A little bit, right? He's the person who cries easily, right? He's the person who we have to manage his emotions, right? And who's in charge of heaven at this point, right? The rabbis have said, you have, your access to heaven is illegitimate, right? The husband is in charge of mele deshmaya, of matters of heaven, and Rabbi Yezer is not that, right? And the way that the rabbis and the role of husband have dealt with that is to say, go away, right? Um, so in some ways, Rabbi Yezer, as the person who is persecuted has taken the place of the wife in the previous sort of stereotypical arrangement, right? So that's just between Rabbi Eliezer and the Chachamim, but they're going to enter an actual physical woman into this story as well, which is going to even sort of more twist it, I think. Okay, so section four. After Rabbi Gamliel Hayabit Babat Shina, Rabbi Gamliel was in a boat. Rabbi Gamliel has never been mentioned in the story until now, interesting, but okay, that's like a textual issue. Or like a histor textual historical issue, but okay. So Rabban Gamliel is now, as opposed to Rabbi Yeshua, now he's going to be the, the representative of the rabbi. He was on a boat, and um, a big wave came and tried to kill him. And Rabban Gamliel stood up, right? And Rabban Gamliel was like, "This must be because of Rabbi the other." So he stood up and he said, "God, right? I didn't do it for my own honor, right? Don't mistake me as having." sort of sacrifice someone else's honor for me, right? And not for the honor of my family, or Bangal Miel, sort of like an aristocrat, right? For your honor, God, Israel. Because I don't want the people of Israel to be divided, right? We had to take a stand because there's something about Rabbi Yezer's way of arguing that's destructive to our Halakha community. Again, it's that question, right? So he's saying like, this was a principled argument and we know that we heard his feelings, but we had no choice. And God seems to accept that argument because the water goes down. Okay? Now that we've introduced our video, this is the end. Okay? Ima Shalom, the V2 Drabi Eliezer, Achte Drabangamuya. So Ima Shalom is stuck in the middle, right? Her husband and her brother are engaged in this epic battle of will where one prayer will kill the other. Right, Rabban Gamliel is the oppressor, Rabbi Eliezer is her brother, Rabbi Eliezer, her husband, is the oppressed, and his sort of, the offense to him is enough, as we saw, right, the person you oppress is enough, even if prayers don't really work anymore, the person, sort of, the pain of the person who's been oppressed can work to cause harm to the person who oppressed. So, she would never let Rabbi Eliezer do a lot of time, sort of like pray, sort of pour his heart, heart out to God, because she knew that if he were going to do that, he would, her brother would die, right? Or he would, he would sort of, his pain could lead to negative consequences for her brother. One, but one day, for one reason or another, either because she got confused about the calendar or because she went to do a chesed, right? She went to give somebody bread, which is interesting, like what each of those two things mean, right? Something happened and she didn't get to prevent him from praying. I know we have one more minute. I'm going to take um, right? Ashka says, she came back into the room. She sees that Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer has fallen on his face. Amrle kum She said, get up, you've already killed my brother. By the way, right, in our initial stereotypic presentation, right, who has to bend down and who's shorter and who's taller? Or like the husband is supposed to bend down to listen to his wife, but here it's sort of the opposite, where the wife is trying to prevent the husband from bending down, because again, Rabbi Eliezer is like in the lower position. He's kind of not only is he in the position of the wife vis-a-vis -vis the rabbis, right? He's kind of in the position of the person whose emotions need to be managed vis-a-vis -vis his own wife, right? His wife is in the position of kind of like the person who's trying to control things. Um, Amarle, Minai, so she says, well, get up. You've already killed my brother. There's no point in you praying anymore. And at that very moment, right, the shofar leaves Rabban Gamliel's house that he's died, right? That's sort of their announcement. And he said, how do you know? And she said, This is how I have this tradition from my father's house. 
Kol HaSharim Yinalin, right? All of the gates are closed, Chutz Misharei Ona, which is the same as it appeared earlier in the Gemara as well, right? All of the gates are closed except for the gates of the oppressed. Meaning, as we saw at the beginning, right? Prayer may not be efficacious anymore, but oppressed people have like a shortcut through the otherwise closed gates, right? So I think, okay, if we think about the roles of husbands and wives in the initial studia, in the stereotypical studia, right? They've been reversed, not just between Rebbe Eliezer and the rabbis, but between Rebbe Eliezer and Yemesha. Because who is the, um, right, who is the religious authority in their house in some way? Right, it's her. She's in the, the physically higher position, right? Because, right, because it all, it all comes back to him being the oppressed person, and then it makes him kind of like um, the most, what is it? The, um, that gives him the power, right? And I'm going to get to that in a second, I hope, right? So she's sort of in the, she's the person who's more in control of her emotions. She's the person who has access to religious tradition, right, on her own through her father's house, not through him, right? And she's trying to manage it. He's sort of in the wife's position to her, right? But, right, in some ways, this whole sugya is a, the centerpiece, Loba Shemayim, he has been completely undergone. Because it may be true that you can take halacha out of Shemayim, but what, what are these gates to, right? The gates that are open for the oppressed are the gates to what? Right? Like, to God listening to prayer. Yeah, the gates of heaven, we might call that, right? Like, Right, so like this whole idea of loba shamayinhi, right, and mile dishmaya belong to the husband actually is completely inverted by this sukya because Rabban Gamliel, Rabbi Eliezer, despite being sort of ostracized from the power of the rabbis, actually has more access to heaven than they do, right? They've exercised their powers, sort of cut off heaven, but they can't cut him off from heaven because by oppressing him, they actually open the door to heaven for him, right? Um, so there's more to say about that, I imagine. Oh, now that I imagine, I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure I could even say it, but um, I've got a little over it, but I guess that that's sort of what I wanted to bring to the end. I'm sorry, I we took a little while to get there, but basically that, right, we have this idea of avoiding shame, right? Avoiding shame is, is your obligation, right? Sometimes it's sort of something that husbands and wives can do together without, like, people who are not maybe so self-conscious. Sometimes it's something that creates a distance, but eventually maybe a long-term bond between people like you, Don, Tamar. And sometimes it's something that can sort of totally subvert, right? If you don't avoid shame, you can totally subvert in some ways the normal hierarchical relationships that exist, right? You can both reinforce them because you're excluding or being the other, but you also subvert them because you're actually, right, if you kill me now, you will make me more powerful than you could ever imagine. I know Susan appreciates that. Um, the people at the Phoenix Library know me now as the person who takes out 100 Star, books, Star Wars books like a day for my children. Um, so, yeah, right. So there's something about, right, that, like, the Gemara itself, after giving this so, like, stereotypical presentation of the relationship between husbands and wives and who's protecting whose emotions or whose shame, is still then willing to, um, in, a, in a real life illustration scenario, to show that it could be actually the exact opposite, right? It could be actually that the person in the position, in the hierarchical position, maybe is the wife, or maybe she's not so good at it, and that's the point of the story. But that, like this, this sort of like stereotypical presentation that we get at the beginning of the studio, I think, is very much undermined by the actual story that follows, which I think is part of the point. So, in terms of right, like husbands, wives, human dignity, part of the point of this is actually like the configuration between those things can happen in many different ways that don't necessarily like you can't predict just based on who's who. The you know the Berea manages Rabbi Mayer's feelings and emotions. Yeah, right. In the story that some of us know, right, when Berea sort of helps Rabbi Mayer like come to terms with the death of their son. Um, yeah. So right, like, I mean, that also is a stereotype of sort of like men don't know what to do with their emotions, so they need somebody who's sensitive to help them. But um, and she does it gently. But I think there, like, there, the implied the implied hierarchy is not quite the same. Because it's not like she doesn't, there's no like she doesn't let him do something, right? It's more of like a Tamar where she gives him the illusion of control, right? Like the Yima Shalom is not giving any illusion of control. She just doesn't let you do it. Um, I saw with my daughter last year play by friend of ours. You know what I'm talking about, um, Yoni. Poorly blanking. Ray? No, no. Oppenheim. Yoni Oppenheim directed play. Um, 
it was English, it was like an English adaptation of an Israeli play that that um, dramatized the story of Amalekhet, and like it was sort of yeah, like she's she's a very power over him. He's trying to sort of bend down in his hand, right? Um, so I think yeah, that's basically that's where I want to go. I know it's been a while, but like this this sugya subverts a lot of its own stereotypical expectations, right, and complicates the question of who. How do you protect someone's dignity in a friendship relationship? Let's do that. Later. So next time, hopefully, I'll end on a slightly different note. Let's go to the last session, I think. Um, so I hope to see you guys, and we'll talk about, um, hopefully, we'll talk about like halakhic concerns where the question of the dignity of a spouse is made um, is sort of put front and center. Let's do that. Thank you so, so much. Uh, you said we'd have some drama and you definitely did not disappoint. Uh, this was a really great class. Uh, thank you so much everybody for joining us on Zoom tonight and on Fuchsia Live and on Facebook. Please be sure not to miss out on our other fall classes that are continuing through the week. We're gonna be meeting again tomorrow at 1 p.m. in the afternoon Eastern for a class with on philosophy with Dr. Jabor Bondi on Abraham Joshua Heschel. So he'll be discussing heavenly Torah, Salam Elohim in Rabbi Akiva's thought. So it's going to be a different take on relationships and human dignity, but it's also gonna hopefully be as interesting and insightful and maybe as dramatic. I don't know, I hope you'll join us. Uh, if you haven't registered, there is still time. Please feel free to visit our website, www.jerisha.org forward slash classes and all of the Zoom and Facebook live links and Jerisha live links are posted on each class. And if you want to catch up on the sessions um, of previous classes or even, you know, do a review of these classes uh, from the, you know, from the first uh, one through five sessions, they'll be posted on our website. If you go to the uh, jerisha.org and then in the toolbar, just click on hover over online library and recorded classes and search for the class you're looking for. Um, thank you again, Miriam. This was, this was wonderful. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your night, everybody. And I do hope to see you all same time, same place next week for the last installment of the class. And who knows, maybe even sooner in our other classes too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.